If I were to say that the Silent Hills series has had a bit of a downturn since Team Silent was disbanded, I'm sure there wouldn't be too many people in disagreement. But throughout the process of covering the more recent SH titles, I've heard one thing fairly often. It seems like a majority of you guys feel like Downpour is the most well put together SH game to come out of the post Team Silent era, and while I'd love to agree or disagree, I've actually never played it. So today is going to be my first time in this version of that forgotten little town by the lake, and well, I guess it would be nice to have a bit of company, just in case this doesn't turn out to be the trip everyone says it is. So, if you're willing to strap in and brace for a new look at that old town you're so familiar with, well, I'd love to have someone watching my back. So, now that that's settled, ladies, gentlemen, welcome to Silent Hill. From the very start, it seemed like Downpour was destined for a future as an SH2 clone. The goal from day one was to create a standalone story that featured a random assortment of characters drawn to Silent Hill instead of focusing on the cult or already established plot points in the series, which seems a little redundant to say as it's been the go-to move for any developer touching the series since Team Silent was disbanded, but I guess it's a working formula and if it works I can't knock it too much, right? Other than keeping up the status quo in the series, development seemed to go relatively smoothly. This time around, Vatra Games would be at the helm, a company that doesn't exactly have the kind of street cred normally required to start developing for one of Konami's most popular IPs. I'd honestly love to figure out why a company made up of businessmen looking to make money would trust such a financially important franchise to such an untested candidate, but at the time it seems like Konami was saying yes to anyone with the funds to put together a PowerPoint presentation. But hey, I'm not a total asshole, I'm willing to give these guys a shot. Besides, who knows, maybe they did what no one else has been able to do so far. Maybe they penned a very authentic feeling Silent Hill story. Or maybe it's a total piece of garbage. Did I? I think I just created Schrodinger's plot. These clothes, I didn't... Is this some kind of sick joke to you? No, I, I swear. Silent Hill Downpour occupies a very odd space as far as these non-Team Silent SH games go. It isn't what I would call a quintessential Silent Hill narrative, but it does actually tell a pretty interesting story. And I know what you're thinking, a good story is a good story, so I criticize it. Well, first off, that's kind of what I do here, but more importantly, when you take on a project that exists within a larger narrative, you have a bit of a responsibility to stay within that established world. In my opinion, this is not what Downpour did, but it kind of did? It's hard to explain, but before we start breaking it apart, let's look at what it really is and appreciate it for that. In Downpour, you play as Murphy Pendleton, a guy serving what seems like a pretty long sentence in prison. The game opens with Murphy making his way to the showers where it looks like he's made a bit of a deal with the guard to get him in the room with this guy. As Murphy proceeds to have a bit of a boot party with Chubby here, it seems clear that there's some history behind this beating. This doesn't seem to be your average jailhouse ass kicking, and on top of that, there seems to be some conditions for the guard's involvement. All things considered, this is a pretty killer opening if you ask me. After this scene, we're taken to what seems like a resulting prison transfer, and a CO that seems to hate Murphy just a bit more than everyone else does. During the trip, the prison bus crashes in Silent Hill, and when he comes to, Murphy does the only logical thing one can do, and legs it the hell out of there. In the first few minutes of exploring the foggy town, Murphy gets to experience all of the typical Silent Hill trappings that makes it such a wonderful vacation town. You know, crossing over into a hellish nightmare reality, talking to townspeople who refuse to speak any language other than vague riddles, you know, the usual. During his travels, he comes across a few people that seem to be just a little more messed up than him and even finds out the female CO from his bus is still alive and determined to recapture him, sometimes at the risk of her own life. And as far as setups go, this is pretty much it. A prisoner gets lost in Silent Hill and must make his way out of the town while metaphorically making his way through all of his own mental baggage. Certainly not an uninteresting take on things, but it is the same song and dance we've seen since Konami pulled the plug on this franchise. And while I do love seeing developers take cues from one of my favorite games of all time, I also can't help but wonder if there are any people currently working in the video game industry who are aware of the fact that there are at least a few other titles in the Silent Hill series that aren't SH2. 
And yes, I have complained about that a million times, so we're not going to waste a lot of time on that, but I've only given you the surface level stuff so far. There's still more of this story to discuss, but I've got some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is there are parts of this story that I really, really liked, but the bad news is we're going to have to spoil some things in the process. So if you're looking to experience this game for yourself, maybe click the link in the description to get past all the spoilers or skip to the timestamp on screen. Okay, so now the formalities are done with, let's jump back in. So we know our guy Pendleton was in jail and is currently navigating the twisting nature of some kind of repressed mental anguish. So what's up with that? Well, as you play the game, there are hints that are relatively subtle for the most part, but you start to get the feeling that whatever happened, it was between him and his son, until a little past the halfway point, you finally get the whole picture, or a portion of the whole. It seems like at some point Murphy's son was drowned and maybe molested, although I'm not too sure on that last part. There are a few lines in the game about Murphy hating child molesters and Napier, the guy who killed his son, was a child molester, but I don't remember anything in the game definitively saying that his kid was molested. Anyways, after the guy who killed his son was caught and sentenced, Murphy managed to get himself in the same prison by stealing a cop car and leading the police on a high-speed chase across state lines. Once inside, he made connections with a CO who offered to get him in a room alone with his son's killer, who, by the way, was also Murphy's neighbor. But he's not doing it for free. The guard apparently wants Murphy to take out a fellow co-worker of his who's been keen on ratting him out for all the illegal things he's been up to with the inmates. Knowing all of this does give a lot of context to some of the things Murphy would see in the other world and in Silent Hill in general. The theme of water being prevalent makes a lot of sense now, and if it wasn't apparent, this guy here is Murphy's pyramid head stand-in as a physical manifestation of his desire for revenge and how close he came to becoming a monster in order to kill one. Later on, we find out that Officer Cunningham, the cop with the heart on for justice, is actually the daughter of the CO that Murphy had to kill in order to get his favor. So all in all, this isn't the worst video game story I've ever played through. In fact, I really enjoyed the darker revenge focus that it had. And while I didn't care for Murphy very much as a character, the shit he was going through was sympathetic and interesting. And if that's where things ended, this would be an overall positive, but there is more to discuss. But let's let the gang back in before we tackle that. I said get up, damn it! So for the rest of you just coming back, I actually enjoyed a lot of what Downpour's story had to offer, but there are things going on here that I really didn't like. For example, instead of having the player's choices tracked in the background like in previous games, Downpour has a more modern moral choice mechanic, like many of the games of its day. Throughout the game, there will be moments where you're given a few decisions to mull over, accompanied by an on-screen display that, if you know me, you know is not my preferred way to handle these things. However, aside from breaking immersion by having bright, colorful button prompts on screen, there is another issue here. By having these moments be so few and far between, the whole morality mechanic sort of fades out of sight for a majority of the playthrough, which makes it really weird when it pops back up again. The beauty of playing games like SH2 for the first time is that you likely aren't very sure how the game is grading you in the background, and you may have no idea how it is you got the ending that you got. This made it feel more like you were getting a story that was kind of custom-tuned to your personality or playstyle. When you give a player these minute decisions to make as an in-game mechanic right in front of their face, you make sure that they won't make their own decisions, but instead they'll try and shoot for a specific ending. Instead of the player asking themselves, well, what would I do in this situation? They're asking themselves, well, do I want the good ending or the bad one? It goes from the game silently judging you in the shadows to you purposefully manipulating a mechanic. And for those of you that don't know why this may be a bad thing, let me spell it out a little more clearly. When you're immersing a player in a deep, dark story like those you're going to find in an SH game, it's a very good idea to severely limit the amount of things that would remind the player they are indeed playing a video game. And I can't think of something more immersion-breaking than having a physical representation of your game controller shown on screen. Not only is it very unsilent hill, in my opinion, but it also works against the tone Downpour often excels at. On top of that, I really didn't like this game's version of Silent Hill's Other World. Now, I want to be clear from a design and artistic standpoint, there are some really cool things going on here. The almost diorama look it has when in motion is really cool, and I liked a lot of the scenery that these guys came up with, but I liked it in a very general sense. When I hold it up to the rest of the games, it just doesn't do its job quite as well in my opinion. The Other World in Silent Hills 1-3 through 3 served to deliver very vague visual messages to the player. As James descended into his own mind, for example, you saw the world twist and degrade, as if to say the further beneath the surface you dig in this guy's brain, the more trauma and insanity you're likely to see. 
In Downpour, I feel like these areas are made not so much to tell a visual story, but more to show off some really cool design ideas. And like I said before, I like a lot of those ideas. Having areas with impossible physics and upside down room layouts can look really, really interesting, but they feel kind of hollow, kind of like a badly designed movie set where things do indeed look creepy, but it looks creepy on purpose. Almost like you can see the set designer trying to come up with spooky designs if you squint hard enough at it. Now, I'm more than willing to admit that this may be a personal hang up because aren't they always? but I'm just a bit bothered by stage and game designs that appear to be more interested in selling cool ideas instead of crafting a world that feels real in the context of the game itself. Not to go back to the original Silent Hill again, but in Silent Hills 1 and 3, the other world was very harsh and, and sharp and jarring, and the point was to show the torment and physical pain and anguish that Alessa was going through, but it wasn't cool looking in a sense. There was nothing really interesting or awesome about seeing chain link and rusted metal. It just told the story correctly and put you in that world. But in Silent Hill Downpour, I just can't shake the feeling that we're looking at something that some designer somewhere thought was really cool. And I know I'm rambling a lot, but I really struggle to explain this accurately. So if that makes any sense to you, awesome. If it doesn't, well, I guess that makes sense. To be honest, I had similar issues with areas in Resident Evil Revelations too. Like, sure, having bloody chains with hooks on them hanging from the ceiling is always good for a scare, but what the hell is the purpose for them being there? To be honest, I have issues explaining this out loud, like I said, and now that I'm having to do it, it sounds even dumber. So I guess let's put it this way. If you're selling me on a realistic looking game world, there has to be a reason behind the design of that world. If the only justification for the creepy water slide slash rusty cage world the developers thought it would look cool, then things will look and feel about as shallow as that sounds. Now, I'm positive some of you are ready to point out the symbolism in every single thing I've complained about, and no, I'm not so dumb that I can't see the correlation between a guy who's been in prison and his nightmares containing cages. My issue with that is that the cage theme feels like set dressing. Call me a fanboy because I definitely am, but I just can't help but feel like Team Silent would have been able to weave this kind of a motif into their environment designs very naturally instead of having it exist in the foreground right in front of the player's face. And like I said before, I do think this is a personal hang up, but one that bothered me enough, I felt like I had to talk about it. Besides, every once in a while I get a comment from one of you guys saying you had the same issue, and that goes a long way in keeping me from feeling like the last sane man in a world gone mad. Other than these small things, I will say some elements of the plot felt very on the nose, or maybe cheap might be a better word for it. No! This isn't my son! This thing's a monster, a murderer! Yes, well, I suppose that runs in the family. Sure, the whole revenge is something that will eat you up if you harbor it for too long thing. It's relatable and interesting, but it does feel a little pedestrian when compared to previous games dealing with some very dark subject matter like killing your wife out of equal parts love and resentment or aborting the actual fetus of some kind of elder god. Maybe it's just me, but a lot of downpour feels like a good idea that maybe could have been expanded on further. I wouldn't call it low effort or badly done, but more like it was an idea that could have benefited from a little more contemplation. Instead, we got a pretty boilerplate narrative. A cool one, but boilerplate all the same. The last complaint, and what's starting to sound like an incoherent ramble, is the fact that there are a lot of holes in this story, and it seems like 99% of them were put there by the devs on accident. In accounting for player choice, the developers obviously included endings that would have Murphy and friends making wildly different decisions throughout the game, but Sadly, those endings often negate a solid portion of the story told to you so far. For example, if you get the ending where Murphy was not responsible for anyone's death, you might be left scratching your head as you just played through 10 to 12 hours of Murphy dealing with all the people he killed. And not just implied stuff, he will actually admit to murders he never committed. Now, this kind of oversight might be excusable for an indie game with one sole developer, but if you spend more than a few million dollars making a product, I don't expect mistakes on this kind of a scale. Just like I kind of expected to like at least one of the characters in this game, but that just was not the case. Murphy annoyed me more than anyone else with his constant mutterings to himself, although I will give credit where it's due, this is a much better way to deal with giving the player instructions while still immersing them in the game world. I like to call it the Max Payne effect. Officer Cunningham was completely unlikable by design, and the mailman character kind of messes up the previously established nature of Silent Hill. The DJ not only has a relatively dumb place in the story, but 
also makes it seem like the town is a sentient being that demands constant songs being played on the radio. Owen oh, also uses a telephone to communicate with people, which is dumb for several reasons I hope don't need to be explained. The nun is literally just speaking video game plot language, which means she doesn't say anything a real person in her position would say, but instead says things that would only make sense to a third party who's already figured these things out, aka us the players. And the less said about these kids, the better, trust me. Oh, it's just you. So to close out this gigantic, pointless rant, I really did like Downpour's overall setup and even enjoyed the direction it went in in the end. It's not the kind of story that challenges the player very much and it doesn't have a whole lot going on once you dig under the surface, but it is entertaining even if it does a very predictable job. So I guess you might be wondering why there has been such a negative slant for this section. Well, in making this retrospective, the goal wasn't to take each game and judge them as their own entities. I wanted to not only revisit some absolute gems from my past, but also hold them up against where the series has gone since I stepped away from it. And it sucks to say this, but even a good story is made worse when held up to the genius that is the stories from the first three games. So I guess you might have a bit of a decision to make here. Either you take a sharpie and scribbled out the first part of the game's title, and proceed to enjoy the game as a dark and entertaining if not predictable tale, or you take it as an entry in a series and use the full context of the situation to form an opinion on where it lies in that series. Now, I'm not saying one or the other is the right way to go. Obviously, I choose to stick with comparing it to its namesake, but no one's gonna blame you if you're just looking to kill some time and stay relatively entertained when you start a video game up. So it seems like I have some feelings about this story, but none of them tread even a little outside of totally subjective territory. So I can't really recommend experiencing this tale or the inverse, but I can say that if you do decide to totally leave behind any and all previous knowledge of the originals, you very well may find a cool little story here. Nothing too taxing or complicated, but it's good enough, and honestly, that's not the worst thing I've said about modern Silent Hill narratives. So let's chalk this one up as a win. Bless you, child. I understand this must be very confusing for you. Now here's where things get a little weird. Based on my very limited knowledge going into this game, I assumed it would be the story that really bothered me, but to be honest, it was pretty okay all things considered. Not exactly my favorite tale ever told, but it did a good job of keeping me interested. So believe me when I say I wanted this to end up as a positive surprise for me. I wanted to come out of this talking about how I wished I would have gotten on board with Downpour years ago. But you'll notice I'm not saying that. Alright, let's get into it. Downpour differs from mainline SH games in a few major ways. Instead of following the typical approach, and for those of you that don't know, the typical approach is you walk around a small section of the town until you find an interior location that essentially acts like a self-contained dungeon. After you find your way to the end, you get dumped back into the town, and through a bit of exploration, you find the next house or building you're looking for. And Downpour definitely does not follow that model. In fact, it's a much more open world type of approach. Past the very start of the game, you have access to a large portion of the map, and while you can go directly to locations that'll further the main story, you can also explore the town, finding secret areas, side missions, and new gear. And on paper, I think that idea works really well. My favorites in the series, parts 1 and 3, felt like the town was really open to me despite them actually being very linear. So this game seems to be the next logical step in evolution of SH gameplay in that sense. Or at least it would be if there weren't a few very noticeable and very very glaring flaws getting in the way. And number one with a big ass circle drawn around it is the game's graphics, or more precisely its design and color palette. The entire game takes on this blue and gray tone when you're outdoors, and the design of the town could be incredibly repetitive. Take that and mix it with the labyrinthian design of this place with its roadblocks and alleyway shortcuts, and it can be incredibly difficult to tell one area of the town from another. I got lost a lot just trying to figure out where to go next, and the map does not keep track of some of the smaller passageways, so I'd be standing there trying to figure out how I can use this one dilapidated house as a landmark in a sea of dilapidated houses. And it is important to note that the original games had convoluted paths set up by roadblocks and alleyways as well, but those games would take note of alternate passageways once you discovered them by drawing them in on your map, and inside buildings, Downpour will mostly do the same, but once you get outdoors, all bets are off. 
Now, getting lost in a big open world isn't the worst thing, and oftentimes it's how you stumble across cool ass secrets like this recreation of the apartment from SH4, but, and this is the kicker, I just did not enjoy exploring this version of Silent Hill. There's never really a worthy reward for exploration. I mean, sometimes I'd find a side quest that would give me a weapon for completing it, but that weapon's gonna break just like any other weapon, and thanks to respawning enemies, I was more likely to use all of its endurance on the way to my next target than not. So instead of making me feel free with its open world, Downpour just had me frustrated when I'd come across houses or buildings that would contain nothing but healing items that I never really came close to running out of anyways. And without a doubt, that is a very bad thing. I mean, having an open world where the player has no real incentive to explore it, that's a pretty big failing as far as gameplay and design goes, but most annoying of all is actually the game's performance in these outdoor sections. So I'm gonna say something, and it's going to sound like absolute hyperbole, but I promise you it is not. Downpour is the worst performing video game I have ever played on the PS3, bar none. And usually I would save this kind of a critique for the presentation part of the video, but this game is so poorly optimized that it actually affects playability. Getting lost in a big open world you aren't keen on exploring can be a little frustrating, but nowhere near as bad as turning a corner and having a combination of slowdown in the single digit territory and screen tearing disorients you to the point where you have no idea where you are and where you came from. I legitimately had several times where I was backtracking for minutes on end because I just couldn't get my bearings thanks to slowdown, screen tearing, and samey looking environments. But I would eventually make my way to the next area, and once inside things would become both better and worse in a few ways. Performance would sometimes be much better, but that was inconsistent at best. Some places would have enemies spawning in no matter how long I was there for, which I guess in a regular game wouldn't be that big of a deal, but I spent a lot of time in these areas a little lost or backtracking for puzzle items, which meant I fought a lot, and that means I broke a lot of weapons, which meant I spent a lot of my time looking for weapons. So not only was I lost in looking for items, but I was desperately trying to grab weapons, and if the combat system was satisfying, or at least worked as well as intended, then that would actually be a point in the game's favor, but sadly that is most certainly not the case. But we are going to discuss that later. In the meantime, you'll notice I said that I was getting lost a lot, and that's mostly because reused assets are far more prevalent inside buildings than they are outside. And trust me, that is really saying something. Running around an interior area in Downpour will have you coming across the exact same 10 or 11 3D assets and textures non-stop. And normally this wouldn't really be something I'd talk about very much, but when I'm heading upstairs to open a safe but can't find it because the room next door also has the same bed, desk, TV, and chair in the exact same position, but we've got a real problem on our hands here. So there I was, running back and forth in the same old area, having no idea where I was, and running into enemies every few rooms, which meant I was breaking weapons left and right. And I guess that's a good segue to talk about the combat, which is not very good. Without a doubt, the creators of Downpour had a lot of bad ideas, but sadly most of them made their way into the combat. So first up we have degrading weapons, which are always annoying as hell, but doubly so when they degrade way too fast and you can't repair them. I mean, you might only get through two or three fights before your weapon's gonna break, and typically that means grabbing the nearest usable item, and that also means trying to kill a hell demon from the black abyss of Murphy's inner torment with a rock or the leg of a chair. I don't know, it just doesn't track right. And while that is a really big problem in my eyes, it's the least of my issues with Downpour. Even taking breakable weapons out of the picture, we're still dealing with a very frustrating combat system. See, the general idea is to attack when there's an opening and block incoming blows, only things never quite work out that way and it's kind of hard to say why most of the time. There's just this inconsistency to how the mechanics of these fights play out. For example, here's me taking care of this asshole with zero issues and losing zero health. And here's me fighting the same enemy in the same situation and getting my ass handed to me. Get away from me. There just seems to be no real predictable patterns to follow most of the time, and besides a wind-up for guard-breaking heavy attacks, you can never really tell what your foe is going to do next. 
And at first, that may not seem like too big of an issue. After all, these games are supposed to incentivize avoiding combat over engaging in it, except this game makes running from monsters just as much of a pain as fighting them. Turning your back on one of these guys inside of a building is essentially a death sentence because they will catch up to you at some point. Outside, it's a little more doable, but the most common enemy in the game has a long-range scream that'll stagger you, and they are not afraid of doing it so far away that you often don't even know where it came from. And things get far worse when you encounter these guys in groups. Each enemy has a move designed to incapacitate you, and most of the time you have to mash buttons to get out of it, and man do they take advantage of that. Group fights should be avoided whenever possible, or maybe you'll get lucky like me where a glitch had every enemy in the game scared shitless of my manly presence, preventing them from doing anything but backing up when I got near. But when that glitch wore off, Downpour went right back to its bullshit. Bullshit like having this monster fly halfway across the map in order to grab me. Honestly, who QA tested this game? Of course, all of this pales in comparison to my most hated enemy in the game, these white things. For some reason, physical attacks just refuse to land on these assholes sometimes. I mean, sure, the animation takes place, but the monster receives no damage, no block, or hits done. So maybe after seeing I can barely hit this thing, I might want to run away, right? But he's much faster than Murphy, and if he drops on me, that's a hard knockdown that'll stop me dead in my tracks. No joke, these things were far more difficult to defeat than the game's main antagonist, the Boogeyman. I mean, look at this. Who thought this was a good idea? Okay, so combat is a bit of an ass, and the open world aspect of the game fell pretty hard on its face right from the start, so how did the Silent Hill staples play out? Well, exploring the interior environments can be interesting, and the puzzles are okay enough, I guess. None of them really got me excited, but they were creative enough and didn't wear out their welcome at any point. I still got lost in these areas, but in all fairness, getting lost in one of Silent Hill's many rundown buildings is kind of a long-running tradition in the series, so nothing new there. If you get too lost, there's a black light you can use that will illuminate footprints or blood trails to point you in the right direction, which is actually a really nice touch. There are a lot of mechanics that feel really out of place in the Silent Hill game, though. First are the balance segments, which just don't work in this kind of game, and second are the quick time events. Now, I realize the series isn't going to stay the same forever, and modern gaming tropes would have worked their way into SH at some point regardless, but this just feels really shallow. Shit! I don't know, it just kind of feels like the head of the project asked his employees to make a list of any and all gaming trends in the 2010s, and then proceeded to put everything on the list in the game. And following in that spirit, the game only allows you to carry one melee weapon and one gun at a time, a trend that was popular back then and for some reason still exists in gaming today. But somehow even this simple concept is broken in downpour. Switching from your melee weapon to a gun will throw the melee weapon on the ground, but with a firearm suddenly Murphy remembers he has an inventory and just puts it away. And if you happen to come across a gun, well get ready for the fun, innovative system Vatra came up with. First you'll need to throw your melee weapon on the ground because fuck inventories, and then you'll have to pick the gun up, then put the gun away, then pick the melee weapon back up. I just don't get it. I mean, there's an in-game inventory, and it would have been pretty damn easy to justify keeping just one melee weapon in there at a time. I'm really not sure if these guys were just committed to the idea of these degradable weapons and no storage space playing into the gameplay in some way, or if they just didn't know how to implement a proper inventory system. And judging by the way they worked with the Unreal Engine, I'm kind of leaning towards the latter. On the plus side, during the game you'll come across some areas that use fixed camera angles, and this seemed to piss off other reviewers, but I kind of liked them, honestly. Well, I guess I didn't much like the implementation, more like I just enjoyed someone throwing me a bone in a modern game. With them being so few and far between, it's always jarring as hell walking into one of these rooms that have these angles, but it's not terrible by any means. If anything, it can be a little depressing, kind of like walking through a small portion of what could have been. So, you may have noticed most of this section was negative, and if you ask me, that's fitting, because in my opinion, most of this game's gameplay was very, very bad. It was filled with tropes seen in other games, but it seems like the team didn't have the know-how to successfully transplant those mechanics into their own work. In the brief moments when the game does start to play well, you'll get slapped in the face by performance so bad it jumps right out of small gripe territory and right into heavily dragging down the experience. I mean, sure, a bit of slowdown can be overlooked, hell, I've done it before, but take massive 10 to 20 frame dips, combine them with near constant screen tearing and muddy graphics, and you have one hell of a hard game to enjoy. There were also little issues I had, like the awkward controls that just don't line up with common video game control schemes, on top of the open world feeling lifeless and empty. 
Now, I know that's kind of the Silent Hill thing to do, have an empty ghost town for the player to explore, but this kind of game world just does not inspire me to go out of my way to explore it. Honestly, I skipped most of the side quest content in this game. At first, I would try my best to complete the ones I had come across, but after doing that a few times and getting nothing but a useless weapon and a few health items from these things, I just had no drive to finish anymore. I've heard from a lot of people that this game is the one that saves modern SH in their eyes, but I'm just not seeing the value here. As far as my interpretation goes, Silent Hill Downpour plays like a cheap recreation of very common video game trends from its day, except none of them have been skillfully implemented, so it ends up feeling hollow and flawed, even when it's doing stuff the industry perfected years ago. That's what makes this section a little different from my other videos in the series. These are things that made the game an absolute chore to play through and totally unfun in my opinion, but given the amount of praise I see this game getting, I just gotta assume I'm the odd one out here. It's definitely possible that the technical issues that made the game hard as hell to play for me simply weren't problems for other people. I imagine console gamers might have somehow evolved faster reflexes from playing at sub 30 frames per second for two console generations. Okay, I'm sorry, last joke at your expense, I promise. In all seriousness though, this was a very disappointing playthrough for me. I was expecting something that would play better than Homecoming, but instead I got a game that plays just as poorly, if not more so, but in new and more annoying ways. In my opinion, this project was far too ambitious for Vatra games. It seems like they lacked the skill to use the engine they licensed, and little rookie mistakes in the controls and game design shows they weren't too experienced in more basic foundational areas either. So I can't recommend anyone actually play this game. I found it far too frustrating to enjoy, but as someone who's been known to forego game design in favor of an interesting world, I could see why some make it into downpour, but I just can't stand it. So instead of ending on something concrete and negative, maybe I'll do a little positive community service for once. I recently got in touch with Tom Hewlett, former face of Modern SH, and asked him about his role in this game, and one of the more important things he said to me was that he absolutely was not the guy who decided a corn song needed to play over the intro, and I for one believe him. I don't know, I just felt like that needed to be put out there. Just cause folks wanna be heard, don't mean they're willing to listen. See for yourself. Okay, so as we dive deeper into the downward spiral that is this video, you'll start to notice an increasing negative tone. Starting with the story, I was pretty easygoing. I mean, sure, it wasn't the story I would have liked, but it wasn't necessarily bad either. Just not anything that grabbed my interest. Moving on to the gameplay, I had to make a lot of concessions to account for the subjectivity of what constitutes game-breaking flaws, but now you've all dropped into my world, so we're going to be a little more harsh and a lot more subjective in criticizing the game's presentation. And here it comes. Silent Hill Downpour has the absolute worst graphics I have ever seen in a game from the last console generation, period. It very well may be the worst executed video game I've ever come across from a graphical perspective, and I know that may sound insane, so why don't we start in on the complaints. The very first thing I noticed when I started this game up was its insanely blurry, low-res video output. Now, it's common for PS3 and 360 games to render internally at sub-1080p resolutions, and then for that video to be internally upscaled to 1080p afterwards. But this looks sub-720p to my eye. I even thought that maybe the internal upscaling was causing the blurry visuals, so I set my PS3 to output 720p natively and had the exact same issue. And it's not just the 3D rendered graphics, if that's what you're thinking. Across the board, text and menu elements are also very low res looking and incredibly blurry. Thanks to this game making it look like I smeared my monitor in Vaseline, I got very visually fatigued playing Downpour. I just couldn't handle looking at it for more than an hour at a time. Moving up or down on the list depending on your perspective, this game is incredibly dark, which added to the whole visual fatigue thing. I would go long amounts of time playing and start to notice that I'm squinting the whole time because the picture is just visible enough to make out small details. but only if you're really looking hard. Increasing the in-game brightness doesn't necessarily brighten the image, but instead makes all of the black areas gray, so you're still squinting into your TV, but this time you're trying to peer through an endless ocean of hazy fog instead of inky black. The flashlight can help sometimes, but it's just not powerful enough. But for all I know, maybe this was intentional. Maybe the idea was to have the game be very dark to keep the player on edge. I mean, in my opinion, it didn't work and ended up working against the game, but hey, I'm trying my hardest not to attribute every negative to bad game design or programming, despite what seems like overwhelming evidence to the contrary. I mean, it's not like you couldn't do amazing things with the hardware. Hell, here's a random PS3 game I grabbed off my shelf. 
It has a vast open world in it with a lot more on-screen 3D models than Downpour, and it looks great for its time. Plus, there's no screen tearing or slowdown. Look, my point is, Vatra had all of the tools at their disposal to make a great game, or at least one that looked passable, and it seems like they just didn't know how to use them. Everywhere you look, there's some kind of graphical issue, or bad looking effect, or reused asset, or glitch. Honestly, look at how they mangled God Rays, for an example. That's stuff the industry has been getting right for 20 years now. Another issue that really bothered me was that assets would load in low res versions of their textures first, and then a second later you get the high res stuff that would load in. Something that isn't exactly uncommon, but definitely not to this bad of a degree in that era. So if the gameplay and story do honestly fit your interest, just be aware that there are almost no redeeming qualities as far as the presentation is concerned. In all seriousness, I don't know how long I can keep this up. I really like talking about graphical elements that I find cool or interesting, but I genuinely can't think of one part of this game's presentation that isn't marred by some kind of severe and noticeable flaw. And hell, even if they hadn't dropped the ball so hard with the graphics, it would still run like garbage. There were a few times when the game would just lock up on me for seconds at a time, and if you think you can make frame-perfect reactions in combat when the frame rate can vary by more than 10 FPS during a fight, well, be my guest. I genuinely just don't get it. Team Silent was able to make a game that people still consider visually impressive on the PS2. How is it that no one has been able to follow up their success so far? Each of the OGSH games made incredible strides in lighting and real-time animations, but the only noteworthy accomplishment I can list after playing through nearly all of the modern games in the series is how Shattered Memories managed to include very high-res 2D assets in their engine. It's amazing to me that a series can have this many hands on it since its creators were disbanded, but none of those hands have made any lasting impressions on me. And I don't think it's just me. Objectively speaking, if we take a look at this dialogue scene from Silent Hill 3, I think we can all agree that the animations, the sharpness, and the clarity is far beyond what we're looking at in Downpour right next to it. Which is absolutely insane, because we're dealing with resources that far outclass what Team Silent had to work with, but for some reason we're getting a game that looks and performs worse than a title that doesn't even take up a full 47 gigabyte DVD. Am I judging this game a little too harshly? Yeah, maybe, but when I play a game in a prolific series that came out after Homecoming, I expect it to at the very least look better than Homecoming, and Downpour, even at its very best, doesn't get anywhere near that. Now I know I typically have some cool comparisons to make and fun processes to outline in these segments, but I have nothing to work with here. Silent Hill Downpour is a bad looking game that performs terribly and is more unstable than a YouTube vlogger with a million subscribers. But I don't want to end on a sour note, so let's talk about the music, which isn't all that bad actually. Coming hot off the heels of Homecoming, whose only saving grace was its Akira Yamaoka OST, I was kind of disappointed by him not headlining the soundtrack again, but the new guy certainly didn't do bad. It's definitely very different than your typical SH fare, but it's very ambient, and I like that. A lot of the music is only made up of low atmospheric hums and moans, leading to these tracks falling even further outside of traditional music than the previous ones. They're also less song and more mood enhancers, and while I would definitely prefer Yamaoka to have been on board, I actually like this guy's style a lot. His music seems to sit in the background and stealthily enforce the mood of a scene, as opposed to your normal SH track, which builds a mood all of its own right up front in the foreground with weeping violins and harsh percussion. For longtime fans, it's going to take a while for it to grow on you, but I'd say it's worth giving a chance, unlike the game's graphics, which may need to die in a fire. Okay, so my first time playing Downpour was not a wholly positive experience to say the least. In fact, I'd say I enjoyed it far less than Homecoming, which is a very insane statement for me to make. Now, it's important to mention that the ideas that make up the foundation of this game aren't bad on their own. Unlike the rest of the Western SH games, this one isn't trying to tie into the established lore of Silent Hill in any significant way and as such doesn't shit on it in the same way those titles do. The story, while not my favorite in the world, was relatively interesting, but of course there are some inconsistencies that other reviewers have noted, but since I didn't uncover them myself in my specific playthrough, they didn't have much of an effect on my enjoyment. But the nail in the coffin, the one element that makes every other aspect of the game feel weak and far more unbearable, is the terrible performance and awful graphics. 
Like I said before, I was genuinely fatigued from playing it for more than an hour or so because of the constant frame rate stutters, the incredible blurry graphics, and lighting that would cause objects in motion to give off a shimmer, kind of like usable items. At least 50 times I found myself rounding a corner, turning the camera and seeing a glimmer out of the corner of my eye, only to find a piece of scenery had caught my flashlight in just the right way to make it look like a key item. Anytime I wasn't doing that, I was squinting at the screen trying to figure out why I was getting a prompt to pick something up without seeing anything around me. The blurry presentation was actually making it harder to play the game effectively. Now, I know I've been harping on about this stuff for a while, but I don't think I've ever seen issues this bad on a mainstream release. This kind of shoddy work is typically reserved for single-person developers putting out early access survival games on Steam. If you want my genuine, honest opinion, even if the story concept seems like a win for you or the gameplay seems interesting, I would stay far away from Silent Hill Downpour. This was one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had with the game. Every part of it that wasn't incorrectly made or implemented was just bad or didn't work as intended. In short, this game is a fucking train wreck, and like a train wreck, I hope to never see anything on this level of insanity again. But don't worry, we have at least one more entry in the series to cover, and I refuse to let a bad game keep me down. Onwards and upwards, people. And until I see you again, thank you so much for watching the Silent Hill Retrospective. Well, my sweet, sweet lovelies, thank you for making it to the end of yet another thinly veiled excuse for me to bitch for a while. If you're looking for more Silent Hill coverage, you know I'm going to have some good stuff linked on screen for you. And if you're looking to support more independent content like this, well, a quick visit to my Patreon page never hurt anyone, right? But in, in all seriousness, dropping the whole YouTube and video games thing. As I write these words, there are riots and protests and people just getting hurt all over the world. No matter what side of any of these arguments you fall on, please... Please stay safe, people. I genuinely hope to talk to all of you again soon. I don't want anyone getting their shit beat in, so please be smart, use your head, and keep yourself safe.